On the occasion of the 10th year anniversary of the installation of the portrait of Hall of Fame pitcher Pedro Martinez at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., I'm going to talk to you about the process I used to paint this piece. You will also hear the sitter, Pedro Martinez, tell you about how our understanding of one another enriched the depiction of him as an athlete and individual. As a result of this generous gift by Gloria and Peter Gammons, the number of Hispanic visitors increased and then a curator of Hispanic art was appointed. The acceptance of this portrait was a huge step towards the diversity that the Smithsonian's Portrait Gallery seeks. Sometimes portrait viewers are introduced to a painting by a label that tells who the person is and perhaps why they were painted, along with the medium that the piece is made of, water, oil, encaustic, etc. In these paintings of Representative Alice Wolfe and Dean Jerry Murphy, they are both very recognizable people locally in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Not everyone cares how or why an artist made decisions in the process, just as long as the viewer enjoys the painting. For those who are curious about the making of art, I'm going to talk about the process. Susan, this is a very nice painting. How did you paint that? I should mention that because of my background in psychology, my approach to painting people is a bit different than traditional portrait painting, where the sitter sits for hours and the artist, out of necessity, stares at them. In my experience, I learn more about a person by getting to know them in a variety of venues and by observing their emotional and physical tendencies. Here you can see pictures of myself and Pedro Martinez, Alice Wolfe and myself, and Dean Murphy, people who I got to know over the year's time that I painted each of these portraits. From Leonardo through Pollock, many artists have been inspired by music while they paint. Written on the back of this piece are Bocello Sonia, Santana's Supernatural, the Buena Vista Social Club, B.B. King, Riding with the King, Opera, Latin, American, jazz, rock and roll, the blues. The beginning of this has to do with what kind of support you're going to build your painting on. The Egyptians painted on wood panels, as did the Italians until the 14th century. Later canvas was used partly because it was easily rolled up and carried from town to town. Some artists still prefer the light weight of canvas but with a slightly improved transportation system, there is no actual need to paint on canvas. When wood was used as the support, rabbit skin glue was employed to seal the piece, thus preventing warping. The glue is a smelly but effective choice, still used by some brave souls today. I am not one of them. This painting is painted on Baltic birch that has been sized and glued on both sides with a PVA glue acrylic wood sealer. Then the next part of this is the primer, the surface that you're actually going to paint on. This sized panel is covered with a ground, a white layer of gesso. In this case, it's non-toxic, um, an acrylic substitute for the lead oil paint, which happens also to be poisonous. The gesso is applied by a brush in six to 10 right angled layers, sanding in between with a sander by hand. The last layer is gesso with a gel medium tinted with gray to make the painting surface smoother and to provide a neutral background. In the next image, you'll see the pose, the cartoon stage. Traditional portrait painters paint from life with the sitter striking a pose. Some artists combine these sittings with photographs, others use only photographs. In the 16th century, Rubens was one of the few old masters who did not paint from life, as he found it to be too distracting. In agreement with him, I prefer not to be distracted. I use photos and videos and in-person contact with my sitter to determine a pose that pose comes from the set of photos that exist in published form 
or that the artist has taken. Then they're blown up on paper in black and white so that the idea can be reviewed at the intended size. I liken it to a tailor's pattern. There are many ways to place the composition on the support. You can do it freehand, you can use grids, you can use tracings, you can project. But the mediums often that are used in combination with this are pencil, charcoal, chalk, and thin paint. The outline of this portrait was placed on the support by means of transfer paper, then freehand using black paint and brush. The image is positioned so as to have his leg move up and towards the viewer, thus bringing you closer into the painting. Symbolism is something that I enjoy incorporating. For this individual, love for his country and the beauty of flora and fauna were high on my list of inclusion in this portrait. I switched out the baseball league patch for the Dominican flag and buried native flowers underneath the mound, which I think you can see in these images where the flag is and the flowers are under the mound, they would later be painted over. There are two common paint sequence applications. One of them is indirect and the other is direct. Indirect painting requires building up paint layer by layer, beginning with the light and dark tones worked out in gray, or another color under the painting. Colored glazes are then applied, creating the effect of light that shows through from beneath the color. Direct painting consists of laying on fully colored layers with the last being the lightest. This technique is seen in Impressionist work such as Monet and the abstract expressionists such as Rothko. In the picture above, the artist is painting indirectly as well as directly. For instance, the face is being painted indirectly and the uniform directly. Now there has to be color and somehow the artist's job is to create a three-dimensional space. Some artists rely on lines to create three-dimensionality and then use color as a refinement of that definition. In the 19th century, Cezanne discovered that cool and warm colors could create the illusion of space. In this portrait, for instance, the uniform is white, but if pure white paint was used, unless it was combined in a very strong three-dimensional drawing, it would look like a flat silhouette. You can see in the detail of the leg of Pedro Martinez and also in the um, uniform of the painting of Mike Matheny, these sorts of white color variations that create three-dimensionality. I prefer to use color to define three-dimensional space rather than line. In the following images, you'll see examples of color defining three-dimensional space. You'll also see in the image a use of a lot of indirect painting. So three-dimensional space using color can be achieved by alternating layers with warm and cool whites. In this situation, most of these paintings have white in them. In this case, the uniform paint actually contains layers of blues, reds, purple, and white. These are both warm blues and cool blues. A portrait is intended to look like the person. If there's no harmony between form and color, the painting will seem flat without life. Some artists follow a method that entails painting the flesh, then the clothing and the background. Others such as I find painting all over the picture a way to keep every aspect in harmony. Not unlike writing music, too much bass and not enough treble throws the melody off. One of the wonderful things that was discovered by someone who wrote about painting portraits was the idea of tricking your brain. When painting large amounts of color such as this white, it helps to trick the brain by turning the painting upside down or sideways. 
This reorients the brain for a few moments and breaks up the tension that arises after painting the piece in one direction. I think you see that here up on my easel. The next problem for a lot of portrait artists, including myself, have to do with hands and also sometimes skin. Hands do present a particular challenge because they're almost as large as our faces. So that means they can compete with other more important elements of the painting. From a color and form point of view, palms are relatively flat without rich colors and veins like the other side of the hands. Too much flesh tone yields what this artist calls the Barbie doll skin problem. Too little renders the image anemic. It's all a balancing act, painting layers and layers, blending and blending. In this particular portrait of Pedro Martinez, the light is focused on his hands to emphasize his long fingers that enable him to handle the ball so precisely. The last part of painting a portrait has to do with protecting it. Oil paintings need to be protected from the elements and in times gone by, worms. Varnish was the traditional solution for preservation and it is still used today in both matte and high gloss finishes. The reality is that it requires the painting to dry for six to 12 months. Beeswax is another protective sealer and was used in this case because I prefer a very soft matte finish and the waving of the six month drying time. So when you think about portraiture, think about how do you see yourself? How do others see you? Most of us do not see ourselves the way we look to others. Our perceptions come from looking in the mirror, at photographs, or from other media. The final decision as to whether the portrait is an accurate likeness and does justice to the spirit of the individual is difficult. A challenge for the artist is to create a likeness of an individual while at the same time saying something about their character. My goal is to make a portrait vital, human, convincing, and timeless. This means capturing the essence of the person at a moment in time, attempting to reveal some of what has gone before in their life, and finally combining the two on a one-dimensional plane. This is a portrait of you in the yes. National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., part of the Smithsonian Collection, which is a real honor. There's only a couple of sports figures at all in the National Portrait Gallery. You are one of them. This is a local artist who you know, Susan Miller Havens, who's a friend of yours. She's from Cambridge. How did this come to be? It's a spectacular portrait, I have to say, full body. It captured the intensity of your face uh, <laughs> when you were when you were pitching. How did it come to be that you, you got this? Well, uh, me and Susan became friends, and, 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 and I got to visit uh, her studio, and I started looking at so many things, and, and, and the thing that impressed me the most wasn't really the, the paintings that she had in, in the studio. It was more of a, probably the flowers she had, and when she knew I love flowers, and I love <laughs> gardens, and I love gardening, uh, she, she right away identified herself with me because she loves flowers, she loves gardening, she loves, that's how she gets relaxed. She loves music too, different kinds of music. And, and, and we started talking, we, we became really good friends. And Susan decided to go see me in Fenway Park. And that day, even though it was a great game, I, that was a, probably the toughest at bat I had. And Susan kept reading <laughs> everything about me. Just the way I was looking at, at her paintings and, and, and the flowers and the way she had everything uh, set, set up for her to, to, to focus. Um, the same way she saw everything in me when I was pitching. And she decided to paint it. Little did we know that, 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 that the, the portrait was gonna be uh, you know, in National Portrait Gallery, that, that we were going to go so far with it. But Susan just wanted to paint a, a, a real image mm -hmm. of the person she knew. Uh, uh, you know, the, the gestures that I had in my hands, what I wanted to say, an in, in impression I have in my face, and she did a, 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 an unbelievable job. Ten years ago, I painted a series of portraits of whom I felt were exceptional individuals. 
I had no idea that this portrait would bring as many new visitors into the museum as it has. Degas instructed his students, it's not what you see, it's what you can make others see. I hope that by explaining the process that I use, I've deepened your understanding of the making of portraits.